Environment and Rural Affairs. I guess the item, Sir Gemma Dolan, Lesion Ked Kesh de Kerr. I asked Gemma Dolan to ask the first question. Gormay Yoga, can I call you question number one? And I call the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And this refers to value added tax, which is a reserve matter and is responsible for HM Treasury and HMRC. The changes that will be made to the agricultural flat rate scheme from the 1st of January 2021 are that farm businesses can join the scheme if their turnover from farming related activities is less than £150,000 and are required to leave the scheme if this turnover subsequently exceeds £230,000. This brings the scheme into line with the general flat rate scheme. The agricultural flat rate scheme is intended to provide easement from the administrative burden of fat registration by allowing farmers to receive a payment equal to 4 per cent of their sales value in lieu of fat paid on inputs. The vast majority of small beef and sheep farmers will continue to be eligible for the scheme, and where farms exceed the turnover limit, they can still be fat registered and reclaim input fat. The flat rate scheme is intended to be fiscally neutral and not be more generous than being fat registered. and thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, would you acknowledge that changes to the flat rate scheme will cause disruption in the beef sector and could significantly disadvantage our primary producers? It should have less of an issue for primary producers and is something which would have a more significant impact um, on beef finishers um, who have been in the scheme, uh, because many of them will, will go out of the threshold very quickly. Uh, because their turnover is quite high, um, profitability uh, and margins are quite low, but turnover is quite high. Um, I suspect that is why the government is doing it, um, to ensure that uh, the scheme, which is supposed to be uh, a scheme to facilitate um, I suppose easy, e e making, making the reclaiming of that easier, um, that it is to be a cost-neutral scheme. And at this moment in time, perhaps some of the, the bigger uh, Operators, um, perhaps it's not cost neutral. So it may have some impact in that the finished price of, of, of beef may be reduced um, because of the numbers of individuals that are involved um, who are acquiring uh, store cattle. Uh, but generally, for sheep and beef farmers, um, they will be able to avail of it if they desire to because they will fall within that £150,000 threshold of turnover. Call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Could the Minister tell us uh, what underpinning schemes and information he has put in place to enlighten the farming community about these changes and the support for those wanting to join the scheme? Well, this is uh, being led by HMRC, obviously, and it's for them uh, uh, to inform people who are currently in the scheme um, that they will no longer be able um, to uh, avail of it. And uh, I believe that that has been the case. It is pretty well known within the sector. Uh, that the scheme is changing at the end of this year, and many people who have participated in it to this point um, will no longer be able to participate in it because of their turnover. Here is Dolores Kelly. For your cash, I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. A uh, question to Minister. Yeah. Is planning to employ an additional nine veterinary office officers and 14 portal inspectors within its portal branch at the points of entry into Northern Ireland, primarily at Larne and Belfast, from the end of the transition period on 31 December 2020. These additional posts are currently being filled, both through external recruitment, competitions and internal transfer of staff. Case Dorlinta, Dolores Kelly, supplementary question for them. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I, I, from the Minister's uh, response, he seems to be fairly confident uh, that the post will be filled. I don't know whether there are any other contingency plans in place, should there not be. And I wonder, have, has the Minister had any discussions with his colleague in the economy in terms of higher education providing places for veterinary students here in Northern Ireland? Well, two, two, two issues in terms of um, filling the positions. Uh, with Northern Ireland um, reducing its uh, are receiving officially brucellosis free status. Um, there is capacity within uh, the department, uh, which is very beneficial. Um, second issue on the veterinary school. Um, I would be hugely supportive of a veterinary school. Uh, my chief veterinarian is supportive of there being a veterinary school. I believe the Minister for Economy is supportive of there being a veterinary school. 
and I would encourage the universities um, to uh, continue to carry out the work that they are doing in terms of investigating uh, the opportunities for a veterinary school. One of the issues that we have is that many young people are travelling not just to Ireland, to, to Scotland, to England, but also um, to Europe uh, to study for veterinary. And sadly, many of them uh, get jobs elsewhere and don't return to Northern Ireland. We lose uh, that skill, and therefore, having a veterinary school which is locally based uh, would help to us to keep um, that skill base here in Northern Ireland, where it's very much needed. Here, Mr. Declan McAleer, for whom you cash, they call Declan McAleer. Um, the Minister made reference in his uh, earlier answer there to the possibility of um, reassigning some staff from within his department. Um, what, has he got any implications, or does he have any assessment of any potential impact that could have for other programmes? Because he will be aware more than we all are of all of the challenges that the department is facing in terms of the various strategies and programmes he's bringing forward. Thank you. No, as I was indicating, uh, because of the, the brucellosis um, free status that we have achieved, that has freed staff up, um, and therefore um, the organisation can take place within the veterinary division uh, to ensure that um, we uh, you know, will reduce the amount of people that's needed to be recruited um, as a consequence of that. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Minister, I was just going to ask, uh, have you had any communications with UCD in Dublin about increasing their intake of students over the next year or two while you do get your veterinary school hopefully up and running in Northern Ireland and keep them in Northern Ireland? Uh, I haven't. Um, and traditionally, there has been a, a, a slight problem in terms of the recognition of our qualifications at A-levels, um, uh, which has made it a little more difficult for top-class students maybe to, to get opportunities in some of the, uh, the, the, the top universities in Ireland. And consequently, that has led to quite a number of them heading towards Scotland and England, where our uh, qualifications are recognised in the same way. I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. Can I ask, in relation to, to the inspector's reports, if any progress has been made in relation to the provision of a common veterinary area and what the medium to long term uh, prospects are in relation to this? Um, the development of the facilities uh, will, will not be completed until the middle part of next year uh, in terms of the, the programme that has been paid for. Uh, by the UK government. Um, they have uh, given some money for the development of temporary facilities, which will be available um, from the middle of December. And consequently, uh, there will be facilities available for the veterinarians in place um, at the various ports. Aaron, sir, or Leah Flynn. For any case, I call her Leah Flynn. Um, question number three, please. Forestry in Northern Ireland <coughs> is a net carbon sink. This has recently been recently confirmed in a detailed report by the UK's National Atmospheric Emissions Inventory on the 30th of October 2020. The report also rejects that this will remain so under a range of scenarios considered in the report. The Department has received advice from the UK Committee on Climate Change on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in Northern Ireland. This recommends increasing the rate of woodland creation to 900 hectares per year as a simple, low-cost option to help capture carbon. I announced the Forest for Our Future uh, forestation programme in March, aimed at increasing woodland by planting 18 million trees to create 9,000 hectares of new woodland over the next decade. As well as helping to meet the UK Government net zero carbon target by 2050, planting new woodland will also help us grow a strong economy, a thriving environment and healthy, active communities. My department's forest service continue to work with Forest Research Agency, a forestry commission and GB, and this research will help contribute to the understanding of the complex carbon balances associated with woodlands as they are established and grow through to maturity. Forest for a Future will become a foundation programme of the Executive's Green Growth Strategy, which is being developed by my department. Green Growth aims to transform our society towards net zero carbon by 2050, protect and enhance our environment and sustainably grow the economy. Case Um 
I'm sure the Minister will be aware that there was a recent report done um, by Ireland's forestry accounting plan, uh, which has shown that the forestry sector in the north, um, uh, similar, to the, 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 similar to the position in the south, um, that both of them have now transitioned from a carbon sink to a carbon source. Um, meaning, obviously, that on an island-wide basis, um, the entire island's forestry sector is now a source of carbon emissions. And I'm just wondering, know the minister outlined some initiatives that, that he's taken, um, but is there any initiatives on an island-wide basis that the minister um, has had a look at? Thank you. I think uh, some other uh, politicians might suggest that uh, this report is fake news. A uh, recent claim that the, the forestry is a net emitter of greenhouse gases was made in a press release issued by Friends of the Irish Environment in response to a report prepared by the Republic of Ireland's Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine on greenhouse gas emissions and removals from forest, forestry. Daphne has countered that interpretation, commenting that forests remain a substantial and growing store for carbon dioxide, and to look at only one subset of forest estate can be misleading. The Friends of Irish Environment press release bases its conclusions on a subset of a report published by Daphne and focuses on woodlands over 30 years old, which includes tree harvesting over a period 2021 to 2030, which is estimating to result in a small net source of carbon dioxide. The small carbon dioxide emission is far outweighed by carbon dioxide captured by the forests prior to 30 years of age, as is also identified by the Daphne report in taking the full forest cycle. <clears throat> from planting to harvest and replanting into account, forestry as a whole is estimated to represent a significant store of carbon dioxide. It would be hugely unfortunate if people um, misconstrued uh, various aspects of a report um, and uh, conflated things uh, to turn it into something else. It is well known um, that forestry and trees are a net capture of carbon. Bradley for your case to call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister um, how the Department captured that data? I'm thinking backwards in terms of the previous five years, how many trees have been planted? Have the targets within the Department been achieved? And is it being captured on an annual basis in the years going forward? Yeah, there is uh, identification of, of the numbers of trees that are planted. Um, each year, or the acreage of trees um, that are planted. So, for example, um, we have a scheme uh, this, this year and indeed last year, uh, and uh, the forestry expansion scheme, and uh, that was uh, launched in June. And we have applications for the planting of some 547 hectares of forest um, this year. That's uh, approximately double the amount that was actually applied for last year. And so we are having some success in terms of forests for the future, um, that uh, people are um, planting trees uh, and taking up uh, the mantle and identifying that they want to be involved. I would also say that we have <coughs> considerable number or, or considerable uh, acreages uh, being uh, suggested to us, particularly by NI Water, um, but by other public bodies who are looking to participate in making our environment more sustainable by planting trees. Well, Jim Allister. Does the Minister, uh, I'm sure he is aware of the claims that uh, forestry obviously provides ammonia sequestration. The Centre for Hydrology and Ecology has made that case very strongly. Therefore, in coming up with his ammonia strategy, will that feature, and indeed forestry even in and about the bogs, which are the concern and the inhibitor? Uh, to some growth in the poultry industry, would that be a possibility? Um, thank the member for the question. Uh, there is a, a, a positive and a negative to that. Um, the positive is that, that forestry can provide a break um, for ammonia, so uh, strategically located uh, bands of trees could, could uh, do some good. Um, the problem with trees is that they are um, hungry for water, and consequently, um, the wet, the, 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 using water close to the, the, the peatlands is something which will lead to them being drier and consequently you, you lose carbon on that front. Uh, so, <coughs> at the appropriate locations, it may be an inhibitor to the spread of ammonia and something that can be considered um, is, is a short answer. 
question number four, please. The UK government has been negotiating with countries that have a free trade agreement with the EU, with the aim of putting in place a continuity agreement that would apply equivalent provisions to the UK. These negotiations have made good progress, and it is expected that a large majority of these countries, a continuity agreement, will be in place on 1 January 2021. Trade with other countries will be able to take place in WTO terms, as, as the case is at present. These measures will limit the impact on local agriculture of Northern Ireland goods being excluded from EU trade deals. I do understand there is the potential for difficulties for cross-border trade, and a number of solutions are being looked at, but these will need to await developments in the UK-EU trade negotiations. Minister, what discussion are you having with the Irish government to mitigate the disastrous impact of Brexit, as you have outlined there, going into world trade ter- terms on some, on some situations? So, uh, what, what discussions are you having to mitigate the impact of Brexit by ensuring that the North can benefit from current and future EU trade deals? And I do know that Mr Coveney has raised this issue as well. Well, I, I, would, I would welcome the fact that, uh, that uh, we would have the opportunity to sell our product um, in as many places as possible uh, with uh, free trade uh, available to us. And uh, I know that there will be a um, considerable number of free trade uh, deals negotiated uh, by the UK government very quickly. And we may even have more access through those free trade deals going forward. Um, however, I do think that because we're part of the single market, because we're um, following the rules of the single market, um, that we should be in a position uh, that we should be part of the European uh, free trade agreements as well. And I find it very disappointing that the European Union appears to be excluding us on the basis that it would involve too much work, and that they would have to um, open up negotiations with all of the countries, and that they have free trade arrangements with uh, to include us. Uh, But it was their demand that we be included um, in the single market as a consequence of the protocol, uh, and therefore they should carry out their obligations to the full and include Northern Ireland in the free trade arrangements that they have with other countries. Matthew Tool, when you cast, I call Matthew Tool. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, it's a slightly novel moment. I welcome some of what the minister has just said. I, I agree with him that it's much to the advantage of Northern, uh, Northern Ireland producers, uh, particularly agricultural producers, to have access to EU uh, free trade deals in order to take advantage of opportunities such as they are from the protocol. So can I ask him what specific steps further to that he will take in terms of engagement, either via Dublin or via London, or indeed directly via Brussels, to continue to persuade and make the case for our participation and access to those EU trade deals? Because I actually agree with him that it would be a great thing for our producers to have access uh, to those deals. Well, our officials are involved in, in uh, behind the scenes of the negotiations and our making the case for Northern Ireland <coughs> on a regular basis. And our first Deputy First Minister did write uh, to the European Union directly, um, expressing uh, the, the views of the Northern Ireland Executive uh, on a range of issues. There is a, a potential solution, but um, Europe does not seem to have uh, been prepared to accept it uh, as yet, and that is, that is diagonal cu- accumulation. Um, and that would mean that goods with content from the European Union, uh, from the UK and third countries, which have a free trade uh, agreement with both the European Union and UK, would meet the rules of origin requirements under EU FTAs. However, the EU, uh, to this point, ha- has opposed uh, that diagonal accumulation. And it is particularly important for the dairy sector th- that we-, we get a solution in this, uh, because obviously. A lot of our milk ends up being processed in Ireland. A lot of it comes back into Great Britain, but a lot of it is sold to um, third countries, so Middle East, for example, um, and Far East uh, would would be receiving a lot of this product. And uh, because the the product is a mixed product, it becomes more challenging. Uh, So it is important that the dairy sector in particular um, gets a solution to this, and uh, I would encourage the European Union uh, to take up the, the solution that has been offered by ourselves. Call Alan Chambers. 
Speaker, the Minister has alluded to me a supplementary question, but I will ask him uh, what impact does he anticipate uh, that it will have on milk exported to the Republic of Ireland for processing into cheese making and the resulting product returning to Northern Ireland and then across the Irish Sea to England? Thank you. Uh, it's tricky. Um, the, the movement to the Republic of Ireland is easy, but <clears throat> if there's no trade deal, uh, the coming back is a, is a slightly more difficult bit. Um, there can be a solution to that, um, and that is um, the, the quantities of milk uh, that go and the, the quantities of cheese or butter or whatever that comes back um, can be measured uh, to have a, a, a pretty much equal amount, and the UK government could be receiving that without there being any, um, any uh, additional tariffs being applied, um, should tariffs come into play uh, between the European Union and Great Britain. Um, as a result of negotiations not delivering a free trade agreement. Called Keith Buchanan. Five, please. Um, my department has been working closely with councils throughout COVID-19 to address increased concerns about fly tipping. Officials have also been in regular contact and been engaging with council colleagues through the local and central government waste working group on the de development of a revised NIA district council fly tipping protocol. While the majority of fly tipping incidents are dealt with by councils, the NIA have been assisting with the removal of hazardous waste such as asbestos and fuel laundering waste, and will also investigate larger waste deposits. Once agreed, the fly tipping protocol will formalise this arrangement and provide clarity in the operational rules and responsibilities of the NIA and local councils in relation to tackling fly tipping. Turning to littering under the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act and the Environment Offences Regulations, Dealing with littering is the responsibility of the district councils. However, I am looking at the effectiveness of these current powers and the level of fines. Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful have been appointed to gather data from all councils on their use of fixed penalty notices for both litter and dog of filing offences. This will inform a review of the fixed penalty notice regime, which is due to be completed early in 2021. Officials have also separately been engaging with a number of councils on this issue. Finally, I can also advise that discussions have also been ongoing with the councils in relation to the commencing of further elements of waste and contaminated land legislation to provide additional enforcement and clean-up powers to both my department and councils to help tackle the scourge of illegal waste disposal. Supplementary for Keith Buchanan. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, with regard to a powers or your influence on councils, some councils would have a, a power regime in regard to littering and, and basically fining people for littering. Uh, I'm going to name my own councils, but also the eight, I think it's eight, and about two years ago, in a period of one year, eight fines, which I think is unacceptable, to be honest, because this, it doesn't send out the correct signal. What powers or influence can you put on councils across Northern Ireland to take the, the, the littering and waste disposal more seriously at a local level? Well, uh, the form of government will have you know, local government have the responsibility for this, and, and it is for local government um, to respond and, and to respond to their their board as such, which is is our councillors, um, who have the responsibility to ensure uh, that public policy is upheld. Uh, so, I would suggest that the best source of actually ensuring that the council um, is is actually enacting its powers appropriately is for the councillors themselves. Uh, to ensure uh, that officers are um, ensuring that the, the regime is in place uh, to have appropriate uh, waste controls, including uh, the nuisance litter that is dropped by people. Philip McGuigan, for any question? Gorham Elgood, last time call here. And, uh, Minister, I love nothing more than uh, cycling or running or walking around the rural roads uh, of the north and through towns and villages, and it's a pleasant experience that is often spoiled by the witnessing of uh, occasions or instances of fly tipping and general littering. And I understand the, the answer that I gave to the previous questioner, but there must be something uh, in terms of uh, a cross-departmental policy or strategy that can do to change that culture of people who find littering and fly tipping uh, uh, acceptable, because it, it shouldn't be acceptable, uh, and the levels of litter that we have are, are a disgrace. And furthermore, can I just ask the minister uh, if he could maybe give us an appraisal of how littering and fly tipping may have changed during the pandemic? Uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with the member. It is very irritating um, whenever you're in the countryside and you find, um, you know. 
fast food outlet, material land at the side of the road, cans, bottles, cigarette packets, sweet papers. You know, there's a whole panoply of stuff that, that uh, people throw out of their cars um, while driving along the roads, which I just don't understand it because it is so easy um, to put it into a small bag and, and put it into the appropriate bin when you get home. Uh, but people just seem to think that it can't stay in their car for, for any more than uh, five seconds after it comes out of a wrapper. We are working um, on developing um, a, a, a removal of single-use plastics on nine different items, uh, and th that's something which we intend to bring to the Assembly quite soon. Um, so a lot of the packaging that would be involved, for example, with fast food outlets, um, we will get rid of that material, um, which does not uh, biodegrade. Um, so there will be a course of work done on that. But essentially, this is an educational process where people need to recognise that it is wrong to throw out litter. It is wrong to fly tip. Uh, everybody knows it, but some people, there's a hard core of people who seem to continue to engage in it, and they spoil our countryside as a consequence. Call Dolores Kelly. Here, I'm Sir Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I wonder is there any way in monitoring uh, and evaluating the amount of fly tipping? I mean, I seem to no uh, notice and get reports come to me uh, from my council colleagues about the number of tyres that are dumped along roadsides. And we all know that there's a premium to be paid uh, whenever you buy a new tyre so that, so that the, the other one is safely disposed of. So I just wonder uh, what is the cost and are the reports are fed into your department, uh, which will help inform policy and legislation uh, by local authorities? Tyres is a big one, and uh, we would, uh, I know that my own area, there's quite a bit of it goes on, and it's clearly wrong, and uh, very often it's left to the landowner, which is entirely inappropriate as well, because someone who had no role in this ends up with someone dumping in their land, um, and uh, the consequence of it is that they're left to deal with the problems arising from it. Um, there has been a, 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 an uplift um, in uh, fly tipping uh, this year. Um, hard to assess fully yet. Um, it hasn't been massive, but it has went upwards, and we would associate a degree of that to the closure of household waste recycling centres. Uh, so we welcome the fact that almost all of them are operational once again, and I think it's um, incumbent upon councils to ensure that they are kept operational um, going forward. I have time to call William Irwin for a brief question and a brief answer from the Minister. Question number six, Mr. Speaker. I wrote to Minister Eustace on 30 October, highlighting the significance of this issue to the Northern Agriculture and Food Services sector, and urged him to expedite agreement with the EU on third country listing from GB to enable seed and wear potatoes to be marketed in Northern Ireland. I have also asked for a derogation to the prohibition that will apply to seed and wear potatoes from GB due to its classification as a third country. I have highlighted the need for a commitment to secure a proportionate easement to the EU legislative phytosanitary certification certificates and associated costs. My officials have written to the DEFRA requesting that specific SPS issues affecting plants and plant products moving from GB to NI, including seed and wear potatoes, are addressed urgently with the EU to enable continuity of essential trade from GB to Northern Ireland in plant and plant products after IP completion day. I have also written to Minister McConaughey from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine in Dublin, asking for his support in seeking EU agreement to the UK application for a GB third country listing, which would allow the continuation of important and integrated trade in potatoes between GB, NI and ROI. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I, I understand the Ulster Farmers Union held a webinar uh, yesterday evening on the subject of the Trader Support Service. I'd be grateful for the Minister's uh, assessment of the service and the rationale uh, for needing one. Um, thank the Member for the question. Trader Support Service is, um, uh, some, uh, is, is a device of uh, Her Majesty's Government, um, its MRC. And it is a new and unprecedented service. It is to provide free to use um, and provides an end-to-end -end service which will guide traders through any changes to the way goods move between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
and into Northern Ireland from outside of the UK. Essentially, the Trader Support Service will act as a customs agent and complete declarations on behalf of traders. And we would encourage any business moving goods between GB and NI to register for the service and get advice on the new processes being introduced as a result of the protocol. Uh, supplementary, Mike Nesbitt. Uh, I, thank, I thank the Minister for that. Given that it means that farmers here have to sign up to the service to, to bring goods, say, from Scotland into Northern Ireland, does he accept that this proves that while we may all have joined the EEC as one, we are not leaving the EU as one? I entirely agree. We are not leaving the EU as one, and that is uh, something which um, is an irritation to the likes of myself. Um, but uh, that is uh, an arrangement that has been arrived at between the European Union and between Her Majesty's Government and Westminster has sovereignty on these issues, and consequently uh, we have to live uh, with the outcomes of that, uh, be they good or be they ill, uh, and we can protest, um, uh, we can seek to moderate and, and make changes, and uh, I have been very busy in seeking to moderate and make changes uh, for the benefit of Northern Ireland and mitigate against the more damaging aspects of the protocol as it is applied. I just like to uh, acknowledge that the Minister has uh, indicated that the health check vans are back again at the March, and I think that is a very welcome step, given that many farmers welcomed seeing the vans, that announcement being made as a result of difficulties accessing GP services. But could the Minister outline what his plans are to develop or maybe even enhance that service? Well, that is certainly something that has been run between ourselves and PHA, and, and there are significant benefits to having it there at, at the current time, and, and obviously um, appropriate arrangements are being made uh, to ensure the safety of both the staff and the users. One of the things that, that the vans um, are there to help is with people's mental health, um, so not just the physical checks, uh, but also the conversations um, around mental health. And we all know that mental health is a significant issue in rural areas. I have to say that um, over the period of COVID, there has been a substantial deterioration in the mental health uh, generally across the country, and in particular for those people um, who are more isolated. Uh, and as a consequence of that isolation, have less and less opportunity to interact and engage with other human beings at a face-to-face -face level. And that is something that I believe has particularly impacted upon our older population. And obviously, many of our farmers and users of that service um, are from the older population. So we really do need uh, to ensure that um, the services that we provide go way beyond just looking after COVID, and that they are still looking for those cancers. And it is very concerning um, when Cancer Focus are indicating that there is around 1,000 less cancers detected this year than there was at the same time last year. Um, so I, I am absolutely delighted that the services that are provided um, at the Marts and in other uh, rural locations um, are, are up and going again. And are there other plans to, to bring it to locations other than Marts out into some of those harder to reach rural areas, Minister? That is something I am very happy to discuss with PHA and with the Department of Health uh, in how we could expand that service further, because one of the big things in health um, that, that we are all aware, with, aware of is that early detection saves lives. So early detection in cancers, early detection in, in, in circulatory illnesses, um, early detection in, in, in terms of um, you know, blood pressure and all of that there can avoid heart attacks. Um, so the more that we do this, the more we detect um, conditions earlier on and consequently avoid something which will be much more expensive for the healthcare system and, more importantly, far more damaging for the individual. Um, so I am very happy to, to work with uh, the Department of Health and the Public Health Agency in identifying how we can expand the service. I will be happy to uh, prioritise money to go to that, um, because it has to be an absolute priority. And uh, that is something that I'm uh, happy to commit to. Declan McAleer for your case. Call Declan McAleer. Um, Graham Algerton, just on the topic of money there, he mentioned it. Um, the, uh, the Minister will be aware that over the past number of years I've been 
lobbying the department and themselves since he came into office and around uh, looking at the needs of the farmers who were impacted gravely by the landslides in the Glenelly area in 2017. I'm wondering, has he given any further consideration to supporting those farmers? Thank you. Well, I've asked officials to, to look at it, and uh, obviously there's, there's um, two sets of farmers in, in Glenelly. There's the upland farms, and then there's the ones who are, are further downstream. Um, the department have indicated that they would have already provided a lot of support in terms of fencing uh, through the Locks Agency and through the Environmental Fencing Scheme, um, and uh, that that's an area that we need to, to look at to ensure that uh, if we did provide support, that we weren't um, double double um, granting uh, for that. Uh, other areas that we will be looking at is the desilting of land, um, the reseeding of land, um, and other damage that was done done to properties. Uh, so officials are looking at it and will bring back a, a report to me, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. Um, but I have tasked officials to do that. Case to Arlene Tuck, Declan McAteer. Uh, supplementary question, Declan McAteer. Um, um, I welcome very much the Minister is still actively considering this here and has been consulting with his officials. Um, and just slightly on, on, on a related but not a related topic, um, again, see in relation to the Minister bringing out his draft uh, Amona strategy, which will come out soon. There's areas like Denelli and other of those hill areas that aren't particularly suitable for some of the low emitting uh, uh, slurry bedding equipment. And just be grateful if the Minister could factor that into his equation uh, whenever the new draft Amona strategy is coming out. Uh, that was raised by another member earlier on today um, during the, the, my, my uh, report on, on how we would uh, implement a new single farm payment system. And it's certainly something that we do need to keep in mind that um, whilst it's something that we want to happen uh, and we want to ensure that uh, it is utilised as, as much as possible, um, you know, we recognise that in certain lands, uh, the weight here of the machinery, uh, the more difficult that it is, and sometimes the more danger that, dangerous it is, and, and we need to take that into account. So, thank you, members. That. Michelle McLean for a question. Could I ask the Minister what scope he and his officials have to review the spending limits of the Fisheries Local Action Group once a grant scheme has been opened? Well, in terms of that, we will have considerable scope um, once we're outside of the European Union. Um, so. Uh, in terms of it, we are currently um, in discussions uh, around state aid uh, to maximise the amount of money that we can have, uh, both for agriculture and indeed for fisheries. And uh, the fisheries one is still uh, one which is being debated uh, quite extensively. Uh, but uh, I would hope that we will get an outcome uh, that will ensure that we can uh, provide good support uh, for, for fisheries and enable, uh, enable those local uh, groups uh, to be able to uh, provide support for the fishing industry. Uh, supplementary for Michelle McElveen. Okay, I, th I thank the Minister for his answer. And I understand that the South East area flag has handed back £483,418 out of a £2 million pot. There was a scheme of a quarter of a million pounds for Port of Ogie, which is ready to go with 200,000 pounds needed from the fund, but they've been told that there is a cap of 120,000 pounds. Therefore, because of the, of the limited grant, then the project will fall. Um, I appreciate the response from the Minister, but I also would appreciate it further if he could look at the, and reviewing this policy in its current form. Yeah, we recognise at present there is an underspend of around one and a half million under the community-led local development measure. And even if all 24 applications under assessment are supported, a maximum of 1.1 million EMF funding uh, would be required for those 24 projects. So that's where the 400,000 comes from. And it's unlikely that <coughs> all applications will, will be successful. So uh, the underspend is anticipated to, mean, to be between 400,000 and 600,000. However, it is proposed that we would open the CLLD scheme for applications on the 2nd of January 2021 and for it to remain open until the 31st of March 2021 to attract further applications which can utilise that underspend, uh, with the full budget being committed by 30th of June 2021. And these target dates are within the timescales which are permitted um, for the EMFF programme. So Sea Flag staff are confident that there are further potential applications that will be submitted should the scheme reopen. And which will utilise much of the current underspend. 
and should a surplus remain as at 30th of April 2021, the options are for a further opening of the scheme to May, uh, 31st of May 2021, or the movement of funding from CLLD measure to other measures within the Northern Ireland EMF programme, which have achieved or are nearing full commitment, and there are project applications in place to utilise the funds. So, approval for moving CLLD funding to other measures, which is permitted by the UK Managing Authority and the Commission through an EMFF operational programme amendment, will be sought through ministerial submission on the proposed variations within the Northern Ireland EMFF programme that are required to ensure all EMF funding available to Northern Ireland is fully utilised and not returned to the Commission. It is anticipated that the submission will be made in April 2021. I call William Irwin for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and uh, the Minister will, will be aware that foreign planning applications are being held up by very slow proofs responses from NAEA. Is there anything that the Minister can do to speed this process up? Um, NAEA, I suppose, like a lot of other organisations, have um, quite a lot of pressures in terms of staffing. Um, COVID hasn't helped things, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we still have targets which have been set for good reason um, and targets which we should be seeking um, to fulfil. Um, we also have the complication of um, what we are going to do about ammonia. Um, I have indicated that at this moment in time that we should use the 1 per cent threshold as opposed to the 0.1 threshold that SES referred to, um, whilst we uh, produce the ammonia strategy. The ammonia strategy is um, almost ready um, to go out. Uh, so it is entirely reasonable uh, for us to do that, uh, given that the plans of the ammonia strategy are significantly to reduce uh, the amounts of ammonia that are in the, in, uh, the atmosphere, and consequently it would be a better instrument to deal with this issue uh, than planning. Uh, supplementary for Mr Irwin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, the Minister will be aware of the seriousness of the situation. Uh, many farms, many are trying to redo existing old buildings, re-roof them, and they uh, are being held up by NAEA. And uh, I'm sure the minister is fully aware of the importance of this matter being addressed. Uh, absolutely, and um, one of the reasons that um, is holding us back from the farm business investment scheme uh, being ruled out further is the ability of people to actually get planning approvals. Um, to actually carry out the investments that, that, that they wish to take place. The remarkable thing is that, in some instances, uh, the, the, the refurbishment um, or, in fact, building a replacement of, of, of existing buildings uh, would lead to lower ammonia emissions, um, and yet the planning refusals or the planning recommendations for refusals are, are, are still existing. So we really do need to have a practical, common-sense approach uh, to this. And as I indicate very clearly, planning is not the means of doing it. Actually having an ammonia strategy, which is effective in reducing the amounts of ammonia getting into our atmosphere, is the way forward. I have time for a brief question and answer from Paula Bradley. Um, can I ask the Minister what steps he is, t is taken to ensure that the honeybee is being protected here in Northern Ireland and what practical measures he may, he may explore to do so? The honeybee is an incredibly important aspect of our environment and our biodiversity. And I, was, I have spoken to officials uh, with regard to developing a strategy both on honeybees and worms um, because I believe that uh, both those species have a massively important contribution. Uh, little things, little tiny things, uh, insects, uh, uh, th that some people may just perceive them to be, uh, but they have such an important role uh, in the production of our food and the success of, of producing food. And uh, it is certainly something which we are cognizant of. Um, we look at other places like America which has lost around a third of its honeybee population through um, the production of almond, uh, because people think that they are helping the environment by drinking almond milk, uh, and, and the consequences of doing that is absolutely de devastating. So we are very supportive of, of that, uh, of the honeybee population, and we will be looking at steps as to how we can actually encourage uh, uh, greater numbers of honeybees here in Northern Ireland. 
Thank you. Okay, members, that, that concludes. If members just take their ease while we allow other members and